Howdy, everybody. Um, welcome to a basic introduction to beekeeping. I am Carmel from CMG Honeybee. And today we are talking about um, the type of things you would need to put in place and to think about and to get ready if you wanted to become a beekeeper. Um, it's a very rewarding hobby. There are a few steps to it. Um, it this is a bit of a long talk, so be prepared. Um, the PowerPoint that I'm sharing today, uh, if you wanted to get that afterwards, I'll, I'll tell you how you can get hold of the PowerPoint so you can keep that information. Um, and I will also, if you decided at the end of it, because beekeeping is not for everybody, um, that you still want to help the bees, I'll give you some suggestions around that as well. So we're going to go straight into the PowerPoint. Then after that, I'm going to show you some of the equipment and I'll take you for a walk outside and show you around um, my beehives and um, other equipment and stuff like that. So you can see firsthand and have a think about some of the choices because in beekeeping, there are certain things we have to follow and um, but there's also a lot of different choice and finding the style of beekeeping that suits you best um, is really important. So I'm not here to say you have to do it this way. I'm here to give you different options. So I hope you find all of that helpful. Um, we'll go straight into the PowerPoint if we can make that the main thing on the screen. Thanks, Joanne. So a basic introduction to beekeeping. What we're gonna cover is, um, you know, why do you want to get into beekeeping in the first place? Um, having a look at bees, what to expect over the season, um, what kind of jobs are going on in the hive and the jobs that you need to do as a beekeeper, the basic equipment that you'll need. Um, there are different types of hives to choose from. So to give you some information around that, where you can source bees from, um, there are some legal requirements that we do need to follow what this kind of investment is going to cost you and then if you've changed your mind other things that you can do to help bees and pollinators so what else besides honey obviously when we think of bees we immediately think of honey now the honey actually only comes from oh, the European sorry bee. your screen isn't showing my screen's not showing no really you can't see my powerpoint no Okay, why is that happening? All right, let me, let me, got it. Okay, so where were we? Okay, so these are the topics that we're gonna look at today. And as I was saying, when we think about beekeeping, we immediately think about honey. But the only bees that make honey, well, there's there's two. There's the European honeybee that we all think of. And then there are, we do have some native bees, but they're up in northern Queensland and northern New South Wales where it's warmer. And they only make a very small amount of honey. But there are many other things that um, honeybees in particular can do and their main job is actually pollination and this um, year not long ago just a few weeks ago we actually had about 270,000 hives um, all migrate from around Australia to the top end of Victoria and South Australia to help pollinate just the almond fields so pollination is a really big job that the honeybees do um, as and yeah, it, it, it's huge within our food industry because, you know, we've got lots of mouths to feed. Um, but even in your own garden at home, if you're an avid gardener, then having a beehive is certainly going to help you with your own pollination of your fruit and vegetables. Um, you get honey. So the bees actually collect the nectar and turn it into honey for their own energy. So they use that over winter for their winter stores um, and they, they do mix that with the the pollen and feed that to the babies. So the, the honey provides them with energy. They just happen to be really good at making lots of it. Um, they produce wax, which they build into their honeycomb. And that is the structure of their home, which they put the babies into and they um, put in the, the honey and the pollen. 
And pollen is their protein, which they turn into bee bread and they feed that to the babies. Uh, another thing that you can get out of the hive, and that's the picture on the uh, bottom right-hand side there, is propolis. And propolis is the sap and resin that's collected from trees. And the bees use that as a glue to stop wind drafts in their hive, but it's also highly antibacterial and antifungal, and they use that as a medicine. And um, we can also use that as a medicine. It's really good for our immune system. Um, another thing that it can be produced um, in the hive and that the bees make naturally is royal jelly. And the royal jelly is fed to every single bee for the first three days of its life. Um, but the queen bee obviously gets a whole lot more royal jelly. But the only way to make that commercially is actually to have to make a lot of queen cells and then you harvest um, the royal jelly from that. So I prefer to just leave the royal jelly with the bees. Um, there's also apitoxin, and apitoxin is really good for arthritis, and um, there's more medical research going into apitoxins all the time. I can vouch for you that it does help with arthritis. Um, obviously, some people can be highly allergic to the toxins from the bees, but for other people, it's actually a really good medicine. Um, so, that, you know, that might be a reason why you're getting into beekeeping um, is for those medicinal benefits. And of course, um, beekeeping is really good as a hobby. It can be a career. It's a great way to meet, um, network and meet other beekeepers and socialize. And it's also helping out the environment. So having a one hive or two hives in your backyard um, can fulfill many different things. Um, now, now, I know this is a lot of words. And for those of you that get this, you can read it later but I will put this into a nutshell. So what kind of beak do you want to be? So there's beekeeping versus bee having. And basically if you put bees into a hive, um, especially now that we live in suburbs and stuff, the hive needs to be, there are rules that we need to follow. So we don't live in a she'll be right mate world anymore. You know, the reality is that our plant, the health of our planet as a whole is becoming critical. And Australia is now the last continent in the world not to have Varroa mite, and the last one not to have the colony collapse disorder. So the relationship between bees and man is very precious. And the reality is if you keep bees, you are also managing some sort of disease. So whether it be chalk brood or wax moss or small hive beetle, these are things within the beekeeping environment um, that we already deal with on a regular basis. And Varroa is the big one that we're trying to keep out. So it's not just a matter of putting bees in a box. They need care and responsibility. So taking the responsibility to self-educate, be compliant and become the best keep beekeeper that you can be will help to keep your bees healthy and secure our collective future. Um, this is part of our food security, basically. So. You know, you may not want to, you may want bees around, but you may not want the responsibility of being a beekeeper either. So there are different options here. So you could host a hive. You might just have someone who is a beekeeper um, can put their hive onto your property um, and then you get the benefits of the pollination and you probably get a little bit of honey and then the beekeeper can take responsibility for it. You can become a hobbyist beekeeper. And so you might have one or two hives um, and then that just ticks over and you've got a bit of honey for yourself, a bit of honey for your friends. Um, you might become a professional sideliner like myself. So I'm not classed as a commercial beekeeper, but I do have a number of hives, but I, I offer mentoring and talks like this. So my employment is based around beekeeping and the education of beekeeping. Um, and finally, there's commercial beekeeping. This is where you might run 100, 500 or 1,000 hives and you probably become a, um, a migrationary beekeeper. So this is where you would take your hives, whether it be to a pollination event or to the next floral event, and you would end up having um, your spots that you would go to at different times of the year. So it would be like a routine or a cycle. Um, and, you know, we 
the truth is we need more commercial beekeepers. There's a lot of older beekeepers and they're not going to last forever. So it, we really do want um, more people coming through the beekeeping system. Um, so it's to look at, you know, what's your motivation? Is it about making money or is it just for the love of it? Or is it both? You know, for me, I love the bees, um, but for me, it's also turned into a career. So it does become a bit of a love affair. You become very connected to the bees. So by checking them regularly, you will develop an intimate relationship. And I'll tell you a little story. It was about three years ago in the middle of winter, um, over over six nights. So every second night, I actually dreamt about this one particular hive in my apiary. So three times, three times this, this hive kept presenting. And I'm like, why why do I keep dreaming about this hive so after the third night I'm like right I'm gonna go and check this hive and I, I waited for a sunny day wasn't quite warm enough but it was like this hive was falling out to me and when I um, opened it up um, they'd actually eaten all of the food that I'd left them for winter time they were obviously big eaters than I thought um, and luckily I had some um, frames of honey in the freezer and I was actually, I obviously had to defrost them first, um, but I was able to supplement their feed to get them through the winter. So it was like this symbiotic relationship that um, I'd never experienced it before. It was like, I'm really glad that I tuned into um, my gut feeling and, and actually checked that hive. Um, the other thing with beekeeping is at some point you will get stung. So um, take precautions. The reality is only 3% of the population is highly allergic to bees. Um, but whether you have some antihistamines on hand or you, know, you may choose to get an EpiPen. Um, for me now, over the 10 years I've been beekeeping, um, I, my, I've actually become less reactive. So I hardly react to stings at all anymore. However, you know, the journey of, um, apitherapy and bee stings it is a bit random some people can beekeep for years and suddenly develop an, aller an allergic reaction um, as I said other people um, they might be anaphylactic and then they go and get bee therapy um, and that that um, allergy can actually be lessened over time with um, a doctor's help so you know yes there is a risk but I think it's a risk worth taking um, as I said only three percent of the population is highly allergic um, you will make mistakes oh my god I've made some doozy mistakes in my time um, but it's all learning so it's all positive and um, you become a, a better beekeeper year after year I'm still learning all the time I'm I'm you know really enjoying that journey and and picking up different things off of different beekeepers and improving what I do every year um, bees in a box is not natural, so they must be managed. Um, if you let them swarm, they because they're an introduced species, they're then classed as a feral hive, and so they need to be collected. Um, and then the ferals can they can become quite aggressive over time because their genetics reverts back to survival mode. Um, and they can also it's a possibility of spreading pests and diseases around. Um, there are some legal requirements, but it's not rocket science. And if you just stick to it over time, um, you will learn, all, you know, learn all the steps and keep learning. Um, so there are some biosecurity procedures. There's a couple of checks that we um, are now required to do every year. They're not hard to do. And I really encourage you to do self-education. So do a course or join a club or self-educate. There's so much on YouTube and um, Facebook groups, and there's more and more mentoring. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of stuff out there to be able to absorb information about beekeeping. Um, you can't, I can't cover it just in this one talk, believe me. Um, if you do get a hive and you have a change of heart, then please take responsibility for it. Don't just abandon it. Um, there will always be somebody else that will want to take that hive on board. Um, so yeah, you know, give it a new home, please. Don't just um, don't just let it go. And if beekeeping's not for you, then you can create 
bee hotels through our native bees and grow bee friendly plants. So there's lots of ways that you can still be involved in helping the bees um, without having to become a beekeeper. And just on the bottom left there, it's a little saying in the beekeeping industry, if you ask 10 beekeepers the same question, you will get 11 different answers, which is very true. Every beekeeper has their own opinion. And as I said, I can only share with you what I know. So this is just the beginning. Just the beginning. All right, so the mood and behavior and bee traits. I just want to reiterate that most bees are not aggressive, they are defensive. And if you can see up the top there, I, that's my finger. I've got a bee, she's licking my finger there. And, I, you know, there's my face right next to a frame of bees. Bees, they really are sweet creatures. But, you know, let's think, let's think like a bee. I mean, if we were sitting in our home and a big giant came along and took the roof off of our house and started shuffling our furniture around and went into the nursery where our babies were, we would probably want to defend ourselves as well. So usually if you go near a hive, the bees can sometimes um, get a bit defensive or, you know, if they're in the grass and you tread on one, then it's going to want to defend itself. So the reality is most times the bees are really only just trying to defend the hive as a whole or themselves because the reality is most of the time when they sting, they actually lose their life. There are some varieties that are more defensive than others, um, but as you learn to bee keep, you'll learn about which ones are good to have and keeping a younger bee a younger queen, sorry, keeping a younger queen will actually make the hive um, more calmer because um, it's to do with her pheromones and that the hive itself actually feeds off of the pheromones of the queen. So the queen can live up to five years and she only makes 16 days from egg to hatching. Her role in the hive is to lay eggs and she can actually lay up to about 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day. She will go out on a mating flight only once in her life, at the start of her life, and then the rest of her time, she um, just lays eggs. And depending on the size of the cell that she's presented as she's walking around the hive, she will choose to fertilise the egg, which will become a female worker, or lay an unfertilized egg, which will become a male bee, which is called a drone. So the drones only make up about five to 10% of the hive. They take about 24 days to hatch and they live for about a year. And their job is basically to go and find virgin queens to mate with. They don't do any jobs in the hive. They sit around and get fed and groomed and they go out in the afternoons um, to look for the Sheilas to um, have a good time with, basically. However, it's not all fun and games. So um, if a drone does find a queen and mate with her, the, he actually loses his life. He literally explodes. Um, or at winter time, at the end of the season, if there are drones left over, because they are fed and groomed, they're actually a drain on resources and time. And in wintertime, the females go more into survival mode of keeping the hive warm. So in all autumn time, you often find all of the boys get kicked out of the hive. I've literally seen um, female workers, which are smaller than the drones, dragging the drones out of the hive. And they get kicked out of the hive because they are, they're not needed anymore. So they're not welcomed into the hive anymore. Um, so it can be pretty harsh. So that kind of balances the scales. You know, they get a cushy life at the start, but it doesn't end well. Um, the workers, which are the females, they comprise about 90% of the hive. From egg to hatching, they, um, they last, uh, sorry, they take 21 days to hatch. And they live for between 42 days to about three or four months. So over winter when they're not working as much, they will survive a bit longer. But during the summer, spring and summer periods, they literally work themselves to death. 
and they do every job in the hive except for laying eggs. So their first job is as cleaners, then they become nurse bees, then their wax glands become active and they become builders. Then they um, go on, so the, that's within the hive, then they go on their first flight outside the hive and then they become guard bees and then water gatherers and then um, foragers. So the, old, the bees that you see flying around on the flowers, they're the old girls and they're at the end of their, um, you know, their work really, um, which is again why they're often, you know, they're old and grumpy and tired. So they're often the grumpier ones that you see out and about. The nurse bees, the younger bees are actually really calm and gentle. Um, so the official name for the European honeybee is the Apis mellifera, and they were introduced into Australia about 200 years ago. So, you know, not long after we came here, the bees came with us, basically. Uh, as I said, they are more defensive rather than aggressive because they just want to protect their home as a whole. Um, they do communicate, they're completely deaf and very short-sighted. So their sense of smell is the strongest. They can smell things up to a kilometre away and um, they communicate through doing the waggle dance. Um, so when we're around bees, because they feel through vibration and they smell so acutely, we want to be moving slowly and we don't want to be wearing any strong aftershaves or hairsprays or even if we're in fear ourselves, we can put out a fear pheromone and that will put them onto the defensive. So being around your hive is actually a very, it's almost like a moving meditation. It's a very loving space to be in. If you're there having a good time, then you will probably have a good experience with the bees. Um, and there are some days where they don't want you around and they'll definitely let you know um, if they're having a bad day and the weather's no good. So what happens inside a hive over the course of a year? Spring is the start. So for me, I've just gone through New Year's Eve. Woohoo! I'm at the start of the year for me, okay? Spring is where everything begins. And what I'm showing you here, this is a general guide, but I can tell you this year I was actually checking highs in August. So being a beekeeper, you need to, you become very in tune with your environment. And you need to learn to read the hive and read the weather. Um, so spring is where everything starts. So you really want to be checking a hive every two weeks. Because remember I said it only takes 16 days to make a new queen. And if the hive gets crowded and there's a new queen coming along, the hive will swarm. So from sp spring really until the end of December, um, you want to be checking your hive every two weeks. Um, the, the brood will be getting bigger. Um, they'll, be, they'll be cleaning out the hive. Um, sometimes when they cluster and the population gets small in wintertime, you do get a bit of mould on some of the frames. So there's a lot of cleaning going on. Um, swarming can start, which we've already experienced um, this season. And you start to see the drones appearing. So when they start making drones, you know that the breeding season is coming along. You'll also see them bringing in pollen. So pollen also means that they're gearing up to make more babies and they'll start to build wax again. So the wax and the honey production starts. And leaving the weeds around in springtime is a really important food source for the bees. So the oxalis, the, the soursop, those yellow flowers, um, and the cape weed, believe it or not, they're actually really good food for the bees. Um, so a good excuse not to mow your lawns, I think. Um, summer, December to February, you probably from January, February, really through December, you should still be checking it every two weeks. Um, but you might be able to pull back, especially once you know your hive. Um, there are times where there'll be a big nectar flow going on and lots coming into the hive and then the flowers will stop for a while. And so the hive won't be doing much for a while, but there's they're long days. So if there's nectar flow around, they'll be making lots of honey. This is where you'll be putting boxes on the hive and the whole hive will be increasing. 
Um, from about October, especially when that Cape weed flowers, there is, um, so from October to December is our main swarming season. Um, from January, February, it starts to die down a bit unless there's a big flow on, but the hive should be big and healthy and thriving. Um, there are a few pests that can show up. One would be small hive beetle and also the European wasps can become a problem um, during the summertime. Then you've got autumn. Um, this is where by then you can pull back your checks a little bit. Um, the days are getting shorter. You'll find that the brood starts to get smaller. So where they were laying babies, um, the bees will start putting honey into those areas and they'll create a smaller area for the queen to put her babies in. And they'll be packing honey around that. The bee, the drone, the boys get kicked out and basically everything starts to slow down. And as the nighttime gets cool, um, wax production will pretty much almost stop. So they won't be building much wax anymore. Then of course, in winter time, that's when you get a little bit of a break from um, checking the hive. So you really only want to open it if it's 16 degrees or above, but give it a visual check. Always look at the front door, feel the weight of it, make sure that their behaviour is still normal. Um, the shortest daylight means that the brood is at its smallest and when it's below 10 degrees, the bees won't fly around. They'll be clustering to keep warm. They'll be eating those winter supplies of honey that you've left them and on nice days, they'll come out to um, go to the toilet, basically. Um, and this is where if we have some really cold nights and you haven't left them enough honey, this is where um, they risk starvation and, and disease can take over. Um, especially like in Europe, you know, it winters like it snows and the hive is snowed in. So here in Australia, we're pretty lucky to get mild winters. Um, but, you know, overseas where the hive gets snowed in, the bees are literally locked inside for three months. So that's what a bee season looks like. Now, the major jobs that you will do as a beekeeper, the reality is that a hive will take up to, one hive will take around 20 hours over the course of the year, which you think that's not a lot of time. And it's not. It's, you know, less time than looking after a cat, really. But in the springtime, you have to be prepared to be visiting the hive regularly. So wintertime is when you get a bit of a break. And that's the best time to be cleaning your equipment and getting everything set and ready for the next season to start again. So you will need to register as a beekeeper and you need to renew that every two years. Um, if you've got five hives or less, registration won't cost you anything. You can register online. I'll tell you where to at the um, when we get to the end. You do need to put your, you will be given a registration number, which you need to put onto your hive. You'll see mine when we go for a walk later. And you need to follow the legal requirements. So um, in, a, <coughs> in a backyard, depending on the size of your land, you can only have a certain number of hives. Most of it on average would be two. Um, you can't have it up against the fence if the fence is less than two metres tall. Um, you've got to watch out for flight paths. You need to watch for swarming and you need to keep a docile breed of hive. So they're kind of the basic requirements in a nutshell, um, as well as we now need to do a American fowl brood check and a sugar shake check twice a year is your health check. Um, and you need to keep records in case there's ever any basic contact tracing, um, which, you know, that's now a buzzword that we have. Well, sometimes we have contact tracing within hives as well. You know, you might in springtime, if your hive is too big and you split it off and you sell or give those bees to someone else, and then you realise that, oh, my God, I've just passed something on to that next person, if you've got good records and you've filled in the change of ownership, um, then all of that can be traced really easily. So, you know, at the end of the day, bees are our food security. And I believe we're all on the same team together. So if we can all um, help each other, then we're going to keep all of our bees safe as a collective. 
Um, joining a bee club is a really, really, really good thing to do. Um, we do have a pretty good bee club here in Werribee called Werribeeks, and we meet once a month um, face to face when we can. But obviously, at the moment, we're still meeting over Zoom. But there are bee, bee clubs in all sorts of suburbs around the place. You need to check your hives regularly for space and for health and for food stores. Um, and so you just want to keep that good balance um, with that going on. Um, you need to not necessarily build. You can buy already built, a um, bit more expensive, but it saves time. But you will need to clean your equipment. You need to do swarm prevention. You will be robbing and processing honey out of the hive and possibly wax as well. You will need to be storing your equipment hygienically. There may be times where you need to requeen the mood, whether um, it's for change of mood because they're too aggressive or whether she's just getting too old or she's um, not well. Um, the, the best thing to do is to keep your hive strong because if you have a strong hive, they are going to be able to defend against the pests and diseases better. So sometimes, now there are some beekeepers that don't believe in doing this and that's totally okay, but sometimes you may want to feed your hive and give them a, um, a health supplement to, um, to help keep them strong. And I can tell you with all of the bushfires that took place around Australia, you know, some of those commercial bush, um, beekeepers, they had... 500 or a thousand hives and a lot of those hives they went to um national forests like that's where they get their honey from you know to the yellow gum forest or whatever um but they need those hives for the almond pollination and so when the bushfires went through a lot of those forests they're gone and so in order for the beekeepers to be able to send their hives to the almond pollination to keep their hives alive, they actually had to feed the bees because they needed that income from the almond pollination. Um, the other thing that's important is to self-educate. You will, you will never stop learning as a beekeeper. Um, and as I said, there's, um, there's lots of ways to get information around beekeeping. Basic equipment. Okay, so... Um, first of all, I just want to say, I'm not saying don't do it, but just be careful if you buy secondhand equipment because there is a biosecurity risk, especially with American fowl brood. The spores of American fowl brood can live for up to 50 years. Um, and there's another one called chalk brood, which it isn't fatal, but again, it's a mould and the spores of that can live for about 15 years. So you just, you want to make sure you know what you're getting. Um, you can get equipment irradiated, but you know what? If you're starting out, it's probably best until you kind of know what you're doing. Just buy brand new stuff. It is an investment, but I think it's worth that. So the basics, the very basics you will need is, of course, a hive, um, which you can buy already made or build it yourself. And there are various choices, and I will go through those choices. Um, you'll need some bees, of course, with a queen. And again, we'll go through how to get those. You'll need a smoker. Um, and that is, that is used to move the bees out of your way and to help calm them down. You'll need a hive tool. Now, again, there are various options here. Um, my favorite is the J tool, and that's probably the most popular. You will want some sort of protective clothing, whether it be a veil or a full suit or a jacket and some gloves. Um, you'll need some way to record keep, whether it be a notepad, a diary, um, an Excel spreadsheet or an app. Um, there's lots of different ways. Um, you'll need a lighter and a smoker and smoker fuel, sorry, a lighter to light the smoker and smoker fuel. And the best one is pine because it burns cool. Please don't ever use gum leaves. They burn too hot. Um, and I highly recommend a metal bucket to hold some water for fire pre prevention. Um, water for yourself for hydration, because beekeeping can be a very hot and sweaty exercise. Um, and also for fire prevention, you may want to have um, an EpiPen and or antihistamines on hand. Um, now, other equipment, which is not essential to start with, 
Um, but there's a queen excluder, which you may or may not want to work with. The queen excluder means that the babies are kept down the bottom and she lays her eggs down there and the honey is up the top. So it separates those. Um, a brush to move bees off of the frames and the boxes. A frame holder, which can help to hold the frames. I don't bother with a frame holder myself personally. Um, clearer boards, again, I don't use those, but the commercial guys, they use them a lot to clear the bees out from the honey. Um, an embedding tool is really handy if you want to make it, uh, well, that puts the, the beeswax foundation onto the frames. And then some way of processing your honey, whether it be a sieve or a bucket or an extractor or a crusher, um, there's lots of different ways of getting the honey out. Now, there is a whole list there. You're welcome to do a screenshot or, as I said, I will share with you how you can get this document. But these are our local suppliers here in, um, in around Melbourne. So I think I've covered most of them. Uh, except the backyard bees is not there. The basin backyard's not there. But anyway, I can update this. Um, so these are our suppliers around Melbourne that I would recommend. There are, you, you do, you've got to be careful ordering stuff because especially bee, beeswax foundation, sometimes it's not pure. So you want to make sure that you're buying from um, reputable beekeepers that really care about what they're doing as a business. Okay, different types of hives. So legally, a hive must have removable frames so you can give it a health check. So it doesn't really matter what shape it is as long as it has frames. So it will have a base, it will have an entrance, it will have an area for the babies called the brood box. It may or may not have a queen excluder. Then where the honey goes is called a super. Then you will want an inner cover and then the lid or outer cover. The inner cover stops them building wax in the outer cover. So the different types. Now, traditionally, Langstroth created the Langstroth hive because before that, the hives were kept in these things called skeps. And basically the hive would get destroyed every time you wanted to get honey out. So Langstroth, he actually researched, and it's called bee space. So he researched the space between um, where the bees built the different cones. <coughs> and he came up with this system, which on the whole is mainly still used today. So a Langstroth hive is a traditional hive that can come in an eight frame or a 10 frame, and it's a wooden hive. Now I can tell you, honey, one litre of honey weighs 1.4 kilos. So those 10 frame boxes full of honey, they are really heavy. So unless you're really strong, um, I personally don't recommend a 10 frame. However, if that's, you know, you think bigger hive, more honey, that's great, whatever's going to suit you. Um, you do want to lift the hive off the ground um, for a bit of airflow and a hive that has a ventilated base also tends to be healthier. Now, the people up in, um, I think it's Byron Bay or around that area, they've created this flow hive. So the flow hive is still a traditional Langstroth down the bottom and they've created these special flow frames up the top and basically, you've got a built-in honey extractor. So you can extract the honey straight out of these frames. Now, here in Victoria, because honey crystallises, I actually recommend using a three-box system and not a two-box system. And when we go for a walk later, I will show you a flow hive and I'll explain why. Next to that, you'll see a poly hive. Now, polys are made out of polystyrene, a very thick, durable, tough polystyrene. And these actually give really, really good um, insulation. So it protects from the cold and it protects from the hot. So the bees don't have to work as hard temperature controlling the hive. They're also a lot lighter to carry and 
polyhives are the main hives that I use. I find for myself lifting those boxes are a lot easier. And you'll notice on the polyhive, there is a deeper box down the bottom and a, a smaller box on the top. So that's called an ideal and the box down the bottom is called a deep. So an ideal, again, that's going to be lighter again because it's going to have shorter frames in it. So as I said, do your research. There's so many different options when it comes to what kind of hive you would like to have. There's a few DIYs there on the side. Um, down the bottom, I'm going to mention the Warre Hive. The Warre Hive has a U-shaped um, frame. So it tend, it's either just the top bar or it doesn't have the bottom bar. And um, these hives, you don't really move the frames around as much. You more check the frames from the bottom. So this is a French, this is a French style of beekeeping. And the way to um, you do the beekeeping is when you go to add the box, you add the new box at the bottom and you lift everything up another layer. And then the honey comes off the top and the bees build down and the queen keeps migrating down. So this doesn't have a queen excluder and it's, it's meant it's considered a more natural way of beekeeping. Um, the only problem I find with a warrior hive is it is a square, so it becomes very tall and skinny. So if you've got a lot of wind where you live, um, I would tie it down or it might fall over. Um, now we do have some horizontal hives. So the, these other hives I've spoken of, are what are we called vertical hives? So they get taller and they get shorter. The horizontal hives, they are. As you can see, they are at waist height, so they're already on a stand. They do take up a bigger floor um, footprint and they're a lot heavier to move. So once they're in place, they stay in place. But you're never having to lift heavy boxes. You're only ever lifting frames and they work from side to side, left to right. So um, for the... <clears throat> for the elderly or for maybe someone in a wheelchair or for someone that's not as strong, <clears throat> a top bar hive or a um, coffin or Langstroth hive might be something that you would want to consider. They're a bit more an investment to start with, but I think once you've got it, they're a really good investment. Um, the frames in the top bar are a little more trickier to manipulate because it literally is a top bar. So the, the comb can fall off, um, but that is a very natural way of beekeeping. So that's a really short, um, a really short um, overview of the different hives that you can get. I'm just going to have a quick cough, excuse me. <coughs> right. Where do we get our bees from? So there's, there's pros and cons to all of these. And so I'm not saying anyone is right or wrong. It's about looking at your budget, looking at where you want to start, looking at your time and what it is, what the choice that you want to make for yourself. So obviously there's a swarm. There's lots of them in springtime. The only problem is with a swarm is you do not know the breed so you don't know whether it's a calm bee or an aggressive bee. You don't know the age of the queen and you don't know whether it comes with a disease or not. However, they are free. You've just got to collect them. But I can tell you my first, well, my first bees were a cutout. They weren't a swarm. Um, and I didn't know any different, but they were really grumpy and they were very unproductive. So they didn't make much honey. And they were really quite aggressive to work with. Um, and it was only once I started working with other hives that I actually began to notice the difference. So as a result, that hive got requeened at some point. Um, a nest is a, is, or a cutout means that um, a hive swarmed and they've actually already established themselves. So you do already have brood. Um, you can cut that comb out and it can be put into a frame. And, but it can be a messy job. So these jobs are usually left to the professionals. But again, you don't know the breed and you don't know the age or the health of the queen or the bees. Um, but, you know, if you want to put in the effort, they can be free. 
or sometimes you can even get paid to do those jobs. Um, however, getting them out of a chimney or, you know, out of a wall can be quite a big job. Um, compost bins are a little easier. <clears throat> you can buy a package of bees. Now, a package is basically a swarm that has been professionally made. So it doesn't come with any cone. It's basically a whole lot of bees with a queen. You do know the breed of it, um, but you will need to feed it because once you tip them into the hive, they need to build comb pretty quickly. Um, and the price there, they're probably closer to $200 these days. I probably need to update the prices here. Um, but it's, you know, it's a relatively inexpensive way to get um, bees to start off with. You can buy a nuke. A nuke already has a laying queen. It has brood. It comes with honey and pollen. And depending on who you buy it from, it may or may not have health issues. There are some not so reputable dealers out there. They'll throw a queen in or it can come queenless. Um, or, you know, you really need to know who you're buying from because I know there were some nukes that went out last year that were not in good health. Um, however, the really good ones, um, you can spend up to $300 on a nuke and you'll actually get to keep the box that they come in. So if you ever need to do a split or catch a swim, then you've got a nucleus box um, as well to keep. So, it, but it means that you've got, it's basically a baby hive, a nucleus, and um, it will get you going quite well. The other thing is to buy an established hive. So I know there are some beekeepers, they will catch swarms. They'll buy brand new equipment. They'll put the swarm into the hive. They'll nurse it along for six months or 12 months. Um, if it needs requeening, they'll give it a new queen. And then you will buy an established hive. So it's already going. And they can be around $400, $350, $400, $450. It might be one box. It might be two boxes. Um, you know, and again, this might be where you might buy secondhand equipment as well. But if you know who you're buying from, again, that can be a way to just get you um, really off and running quite quickly. Um, the other thing is <clears throat> if you buy a, a new or you catch a swarm, you may need to buy just a queen. Now, you can't buy a queen on its own. She needs the hive to survive. Um, but you may need to replace the queen that you've got. And, again, they range between $30 and $50. Um, but at least you know the breed of the queen. So a good supplier um, will know the breed of the bee and they will also insist that before you buy your nuke or bees off of them, they will want your registration because they have to do a transfer of ownership. So if the person you're buying from isn't asking those kind of questions, I would probably go somewhere else. Um, You'll be wanting to keep the hive healthy and strong to help reduce robbing and pests and spread of pests and disease. You will want to keep a healthy, calm queen. You will want to be providing nectar, pollen and water and afternoon shade for your bees. And you don't want to take too much honey. Make sure that you leave enough of them to get through the winter. Okay, our legal requirements. <clears throat> so you will need to register as a beekeeper. And here in Victoria, you will be registering with agriculture.vic.gov.au. If you go into that website and just go into the search area and put in bees, their whole section of honeybees will come up. And that is where you register. You can register for free up to five hives. You'll need to read and follow the apiary code of practice and also the biosecurity code. Now, some of the biosecurity code is for beekeepers that have more than 50 hives, but some of it does apply to the hobby beekeepers as well. Please take on board that Agriculture Victoria is our friend. They are our governing body and they want us to communicate with them. Um, they want us to keep records. If we run into any problems, feel free to reach out to them as a resource. They are really supportive of us as beekeepers and us working together 
to keep the health of our bees in Australia um, healthy going into the future. Um, make sure that if your fence is less than two metres high, your hive needs to be three metres away from the fence. Um, the average number of hives on a house block is two. You need to minimise swarming. And if you do have a swarm, then try and catch it. You need to provide water for your bees. Uh, and a little tip, don't put the water right outside the front of the hive because on a rainy day when they are busting to go to the toilet and they come flying out of the hive when the sun comes out, their toilet can be right in the front of the hive. So put the water over to the side or behind the hive or somewhere else in the yard where they can fly to it. Keep your docile queen so that your hive stays docile. Store your equipment to minimise robbing. I can tell you bees are opportunists and they will smell honey from, well, from a kilometre away. Um, so you really want to don't leave any wax or comb or stuff outside um, and it will, you know, it'll attract ants and wasps and other things like that as well. Um, take into consideration the flight path of your bees. Um, generally, I like to put the hive so that it gets morning sun and I face the door facing north and that it gets some afternoon shade. But sometimes, depending, if, you know, if you've got an awkward backyard, you may have to face your hive east or put a barrier up in front of the front door so the bees fly up and out so that they're not flying over the neighbour's fence. Um, abandoned or neglected hives are reportable. There are certain diseases that are reportable, um, but there are courses that you can do to learn all about that. Um, you need to keep your equipment hygienic and you can treat it, especially if you get AFB at any point. Um, it's not very common, but it, it is out there. Safety. Wear protective clothing. Consider flight paths. Be aware of the allergies. Scrape it. If you get stung, don't squeeze it. Scrape it out. Be calm around your bees. Be aware of fire band-aids, so don't use your smoker. Be aware of working in isolation and especially if you have to travel a long way and working in the heat, stay hydrated and be aware of the heavy lifting involved in beekeeping. Um, just be aware that swarms and feral colonies can spread disease. Um, a swarm is fairly, be calm around a swarm. You don't need to panic and don't call poisons, call an expert. Um, there are, you know, local clubs and swarm patrol and bee removal people that will come and get those bees and they, you know, so they can be given another home. They don't have to be killed often. Right, what's this all going to cost you? <clears throat> so to register your hives is free. Agriculture Victoria have this online system called Bee Max. So if you Google Bee Max, you'll find that. Um, and then you can actually put your record keeping on there. That's where you tick the box to say you've done your health check. Um, so it's like, uh, no, it's not Facebook for beekeeping, but you get what I mean. It's an online platform. Um, a hive, depending on whether you build it yourself or whether you buy it outright, um, is going to cost anywhere from, you know, 150 bucks to probably 1400 bucks for a super duper flow hive these days um the horizontal hives are around 450 500 dollars and there's a guy in ballarat that makes them um frames and foundation now you will need to replace these on a semi-regular basis so they are kind of disposable and they cost between four and ten dollars each um, flow frames, you can have a normal hive and put the flow frames on there. Um, your suit, again, it depends on what you want to invest in. Um, I invested in um, a really expensive bee suit and it has so far has lasted me about five or six years. And I work in it almost every day and I'm really glad that I invested in a good suit. Um, bees can be free up to, you know, 350, 400 bucks if you're going to buy an established hive. Gloves, I sometimes work without gloves. Sometimes I work with dishwashing gloves um, or you can buy leather gloves. Your smoker, 
your hive tool, your extractor. I'll show you a DIY method that'll cost you about 40 bucks to put together. Um, a double sieve, probably worth investing in, but you can use cheesecloth. Um, you can buy starter kits where you get the suit and the smoker and the gloves and the hive tool all together. Um, there are courses that you can do and there's online courses these days as well. Um, you will want to get some hands-on experience. You want to learn about pests and diseases. You want to learn how to identify things. These are the things that you will get in a good course. How to light a smoker, um, how to do a health check and do pack down. Um, so there's spring health check and autumn pack down and a good course will give you other tips and tricks and stuff as well, or a good mentor as well. Join a bee club. Um, and or get a mentor, Facebook groups. There's good YouTubes like the Fat Bee Man or the Bush Bee Man. Um, there is a free one day, uh, it's a biosecurity course that you can do um, online to learn about the pests and diseases if you decide to do beekeeping. Um, you can just be a host of a hive and again, some people might do that for free. Um, some people might charge for it. It depends on who you're talking to. Or you might host a hive and then engage in mentoring. So you kind of learn about beekeeping before you commit financially to actually buying the hive. Um, there are some useful links there. If you want to take a screenshot of that, you're welcome to. Um, or as I said, I'll be showing you how you can get hold of this um, presentation to print it out for yourself as a PDF. Okay, I've changed my mind. How else can I help? So if you don't want to become a beekeeper, actually, no, let me go to here first. Groups that can help you. So if you do want to become a beekeeper, our local beekeeping group here around the western suburbs of Melbourne is Werribeeks. You can go to werribeeks.org.au. They also have a Facebook page. As I said, I am Carmel from CMG Honeybee. I offer mentoring, one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And the this presentation, you can actually download it. It's only $5. So if you go to cmghoneybee.com.au, you can um, get hold of, um, you can download this whole presentation and you'll have all of those websites and information. Um, another, this is now, this is a new platform. It's only just been launched and it's called hivebuddy.com.au, hivebuddy.com.au. Um, I will be coming a part of that. So this will be a group of mentors um, and we're expanding all around Australia. So this will be online group mentoring. Um, so there'll be like a call, a live call once a fortnight. And you will be, so it is a paid service, um, but you'll be able to pick my brains or, you know, there might be another mentor that you resonate with better. Um, so this is a form of mentoring, but it's not one-on-one. -on -one. It's um, via like a Zoom call platform in a group, um, but it's a way of, of getting regular support and information. Um, and the other one up there, Swarm Patrol, if you don't have bees and you find a swarm, you can log it on Swarm Patrol. This is worldwide. So when you put in the address of where the swarm is, the beekeepers that have registered in your local area, they will get notification of the swarm. Or if you're a beekeeper and you want to collect a swarm and you like collecting swarms, um, you can register yourself on Swarm Patrol and become part of that community. Okay, if you don't want to do beekeeping, but you still want to help, what can you do? Provide water for the bees. Um, you know, every living creature needs water, but make sure it's safe. They need something to land on or they will drown whether it's some duckweed in a pond or some water plants or some rocks or whatever, um, give them some little layers so that they can land and drink the water. Bee-friendly plants. Now, today you've all been given a gift, hopefully, of some bee-friendly plants. 
they are mixed with vermiculite so you can sprinkle them around easier um because some of the seeds are so so small but again if you just do a google research there's so many plants that will help not just the bees but other pollinators um buy local honey find your local beekeepers like myself and buy local honey because if i have an income coming in then I can keep helping the bees myself and looking after the bees. Also, don't use um, don't use insecticides. Even herbicides and fungicides are not good for the insects. Um, <clears throat> so, if you can be more mindful of that in your garden, and if you do need to spray, spray on the plant when there's no flowers on it. The bee, if there's no flowers, the bees aren't interested. So um, and spray when they've gone to bed at night so that um it's already dry on the plant um there was an incident up at the almond pollination at one particular farm this year and um the hives will survive but you know they got they got knocked around a little bit so just be mindful if you have to use those chemicals please be very careful if you don't have to please don't Leave the weeds for the bees. <coughs> oh, I've done a lot of talking. Leave the weeds for the bees. Don't mow your lawns if you don't want to. <laughs> um, it provides good food for the bees. And again, I've already mentioned swarm patrol. If you find a swarm, don't kill it. Let it be given a new home. Okay, so these are our pollinators. If you don't want a beehive, but you want to help the pollinators, these are all of the pollinators that you can help out. Not just native bees, but hoverflies, um, birds, bats. Um, but we do have a few. They live solitary. The blue banded bee, the home elictus and the leaf cutter are some popular ones here in Victoria. If you want to do some research, um, it's a fascinating area. And I really wish I had more time to look into native bees myself. Um, they're quite fascinating. They do live solitary lives and you can provide insect hotels to help with our um, native pollinators as well. So let's recap. Our food security is up to us. Um, if we can help each other, register and follow the rules, join a local bee club, self-educate, educate, educate, be ready for the commitment and learn to love and learn to read your bees. Your bees will teach you so much if you really just take the time and go, okay, what is my hive telling me today? So that's it in a nutshell. I'm going to stop sharing. Do, do, do. And, oh, and we're going to go back to the other one. Can you do the other one? I'm on the other screen now. Yep, excellent. All right, so let's pop over to the other screen. I want to show you some equipment I've got here. So basic equipment. This is what a hive tool looks like. This is a J hook. And it has. A, this is a beautifully engineered piece of equipment, believe it or not. And this will be your one of your best friends when you are beekeeping. Um, here's some very dirty looking gloves, which is why... I actually prefer to work without gloves um, or I'll use dishwashing gloves. Um, but these are the gloves that they tend to be leather up the top. And you want to get gloves when you're buying gloves. A lot of them stop the leather about here. If you can get ones with extended leather, because it will protect your wrist area. OK, so just when you're looking for gloves, be mindful of that. You'll need a smoker. And as I said, often you can buy a kit. I know Flow Hive, you can buy these in a kit so they all come together. I'm going to show you. Now, when you're buying your suit or your jacket, I highly recommend you get, see this material? It's see-through, okay? And it comes in three layers. So you've got... You've got this inner mesh, the outer mesh, and in the middle is this thicker, um, it's like that non-slip mat kind of. And the theory is that the, the thickness of this 
um, mesh is thicker than the length of the stinger of the bee. And the beauty with the mesh is that they can try and sting you, but they won't reach you and their stinger doesn't get pulled out. So they don't die. And the beauty of this is it breathes. So you're much cooler. Beekeeping is very hot work and you will stay much cooler and it's called a ventilated. So it's a ventilated jacket or a ventilated suit. Highly, highly recommend them. I would never buy just a cotton one. Now, as far as the top part goes, um, this is a fencing hood. You can buy them with a, um, like a hat on the top, a wide brimmed hat. With this one, this can collapse and it can touch your nose sometimes. I actually prefer this personally. Some people wear a cap with a brim, um, but other people, they prefer the wide brimmed hat. So this one is a jacket. So this one you can throw over, wear jeans or something down the bottom. And then, of course, you can buy, this is the full suit. And this is the one I bought. This was an Ultra Breeze, and I invested in this many years ago, and I'm really, really, really glad I did. So if you're still with me and you're still keen, let's go for a walk outside. I'm going to unplug you here. Um, I might leave the meeting on the other one, Joanne. Am I still a hope yet? I'm going to leave that meeting. All right. And let's go for a walk outside, if you're still with me. And we'll go and have a look at some hives outside. And you'll be able to see the different hives. And um, and also some extracting equipment, how to get the honey out. Because um, it'll just give you a better idea of perhaps the choices that you want to make. Okay, so we're going to go over here first. And there we've got some hives over here. I hope the internet holds up. I do have 3G out here, so I hope this stays together. All right, so I want to show you this one first. This is a top bar hive, but a long Langstroth would be the same. And this is a swarm. So if you're going to do a top bar, there's the bees coming and going out of there. And the reason I put my jacket on. So this is on the stand. And you lift up the lid. And there goes the polystyrene for insulation. And so these are, now this is a top bar hive. So it literally is just a bar. And the bees are down in there. I haven't even used my smoker, but they're getting a little bit upset. So I'm going to close them up because they're going, you've just disturbed us. Now you can get this kind of hive as a, it's called a coffin hive or a long Langstroth. So it would take the normal frames. And I'm going to show you what those frames um, look like in a minute. I'll put that foam away later. Now here's some wooden hives. These belong to um, somebody else. We made some splits. And you can see they're coming in with the there. That's a nice strong hive. So they've got the sun shining on them. So these hives are all facing north. So the sun comes up in the east, it comes across, and then they get shade from the trees in the afternoon. All right, let's go have a look at a poly hive. And so you can also, you can see the branding, the number. So that's the other beekeeper. This is my registration number here. And this is a poly hive. So this is a bit more insulated. We've got the bees coming and going out of there. 
this one went up to the almonds actually and then <clears throat> this one is a flow hive now if you buy a flow hive it will come as the bottom box and the top flow box but here in Victoria, because it's colder, the honey actually will crystallise. So we recommend this third box, which you can buy at a beekeeping supply shop. And so in winter time, you'll take this flow hive away. Otherwise, the honey will crystallise in the flow frames. And you will leave this box as a box of honey for the bees. Okay. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put you on a stand here so I can have both hands free. All righty. And we're going to open this up and have a look inside. Okay, so the roof comes off. This is the inner cover. And these are the flow frames. Now, if I was harvesting, what you do, you can take out this bit here. You've got these bits here that come out. And then you've got these little tubes. So the tube goes in here. So this is the built-in extractor. And then you've got this key and the key goes in the top. And as you turn the key, so you've got the honeycomb like this, it shifts it to that and then the honey can flow out. And when you're finished, you turn the key and it shifts it back into honeycomb again. It's quite ingenious. So this is an expensive hive, but it means that you've got the built-in extractor in the top of it. So quite clever, quite clever. I'm just gonna do this back up. Then I'm gonna take this box off and I'll show you into the bottom part. When you're taking boxes off, um, I like to keep things clean. So I'm going to put this box onto the inner cover. This is the queen excluder that I was talking about earlier. So the queen excluder stops the babies and the queen from getting up the top. And so it's just honey in the top. And with the flow frame, with the flow frames these holes are a lot bigger and if the queen lays in here they become all boys you don't get any girls at all so you really don't want the queen to get up into the flow frames at all this is what the frames look like so they start out as this is the beeswax foundation that you put on and in, you embed it onto the wires. Then the bees, they build it out into honeycomb. So that's nice fresh honeycomb. This one, as you can see, the different colors. So that was honey at the top, but this is the brood area. So the brood gets a bit darker. Now that's still okay to use. That could go back into a hive again. But this next one, as you can see, see how it's getting quite black now? So this one, you would take all of that off and then you would put a fresh foundation on. So that's why, as I said before, these frames and the foundation, they become disposable items. Now, the really good thing about this though, is you can melt it all down and process the wax. And there are people around that will roll the wax out and roll it back into, foundation again so then you can put your own beeswax back onto your hives again which is what i do okay let me turn you back around again oh here i am hello all right let's go and look at some extraction equipment so that's a few different hives in a nutshell just really quickly um, so you can make some choices as to what might suit you. 
and then we'll go and look at some different extraction. I actually have just basic testing when you've got lots and lots of boxes to get through. So welcome into my honey room. Oh, I'm going to turn you around again. There we go. Remember the QR code, you all need to scan in. All right, here we go inside. So these are all my honeys and they're in suburbs. So I actually keep all my suburbs separate. Hobbs Crossing, Hobbs Crossing North, Sunshine West. I can be a bit pedantic. I've got some of my allergy blends up here, beeswax wraps. And you can come and taste all of the different, these are all the different batches I've got. Right, but we want to talk about extracting, yeah? So let's talk about extracting. So if you want to spend a lot of money, you can buy an extractor. Now, this is my buy ones with a hand crank. Um, but that, that was the last thing I got. To be perfectly honest, this is how I started. I started with, and you can buy these buckets at Bunnings. They're food grade buckets. And I just drilled a whole lot of holes in the bottom of it. So I'm going to use this bucket as an example. This is, this is wax from the press. but So we're going to pretend this is an empty bucket. This is the lid that obviously I've cut into a donut. Then I put this bucket on the top. And then I would cut out, I would take my frame of honey and cut all of the wax out and mush it all up and put it in here and put the lid on. And so then that would drain through down into the bottom. So that was how I started. And I did that for about two or three years. Then after that, I bought the crusher. So this is the crusher. And that's been draining overnight. See, dripping out. This is the wax that you get out of the crusher. So, you know, it. This is ready now. I'll give that a wash, and I'll melt that down, and that'll become that beautiful beeswax that you were looking at before. So, this is what I started. I started off with a bucket, then I went to the crusher, and then I finally got myself an extractor, which is already looking a bit worse for wear. Um. The other thing I would highly recommend you invest in, and this is a double sieve, all right? Here, let me get this one. So again, these have been draining overnight. So that's the fine sieve underneath there. And this is the coarse sieve. And then you end up with the honey down below. So this is, we spent all day yesterday extracting honey. And um, and I would recommend yourself a double sieve um, because it really does make things much easier. So there we go. I'm thinking if anyone has any questions, now would be the time to start asking them. What do we got here? No, I don't want to raise my hand. Is there a question? Anyone got any questions? Hi. Hi, Carmel. That was oh, that was thoroughly interesting. So thank you. Um, You're welcome. Yeah. Now I looked on your website and I saw the option was that you could have a have a hive on on your property and then you do some learn, then you educate um, for a year. While that host hives host, yep. it, yeah, host and mentoring. Yep. Do you provide the hive? Yeah, my hive, my responsibility. Yes. Okay, and then you educate during the uh, during the year. You right. would, yes. Yeah. Well, I would, I would let you know when I'm coming. Yes. And um, and if you know, you would probably need to invest in a a suit or a jacket yourself. Yes. Um, but, you know, I would have the hive tool and the smoker and that sort of thing. And so when I'm doing my checks, you can be there with me and I would be ed I would be mentoring you like it was your hive. Right. So um, you can try before you buy, I'm thinking. 
correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yes. And could my husband be present too? Like absolutely. Two? Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. And do you come um, to the home before just to see if there's a suitable place to put a hive? Yes, correct. So um, that's called a site visit. So I yes. would come and it would be about a half an hour visit and we'd have a bit of a walk around. Yes. Uh, obviously the hive, they want morning sun, um, daytime sun, afternoon shade. Yes, yes. Um, so that's I'll, I'll actually go out to another area now and show you. So here's another spot I've got out here. I can turn around. Uh, come on, phone. There we go. Okay. So this is another spot where I've got, these are my main set of hives. Mm. So I've got a water source nearby. And again, this is facing north. So the sun comes up over there. They get good daytime sun. And then they're shaded from the rain and the southerly wind. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there a preferred time of year to start that? Um, because I've got established hives, not really. Obviously, now is the busiest time and you'll probably get the most enjoyment out of it. Um, and you probably, you know, it's the start of the cycle. Um, however, I will let you know that um, my hives at the moment, there will be a little bit of delay in me being able to get them out for hosting. Um, because of the incident that happened up at the Almonds. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. And so, uh, are you doing? Vis are about, you doing? Sorry. In about four weeks' time, I can I can give them, I can start hosting them out. Yeah. Okay. And so you can still visit and mentor during COVID and those restrictions. So um, beekeeping, if beekeeping is animal husbandry, yes. and if we don't manage the hives, they swarm. Right, so you can mm. still do the mentoring and start that. At this, at Correct, the yeah. We have to wear masks and all of that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, yep. But, yeah, I, I have to manage my hives. Yes, of course. Yes, yep. yes, yes. I just didn't know whether starting up was a, you know, a different scenario. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, that sounds very, very interesting. So um, you might hear from me. <laughs> no problem. You've got my contact details. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Carmel, Susan asked when you're in your um, shop area, how do you keep the ants away? How do I? Well, I, I, I actually haven't had too much of an ant problem in there. Um, we, when we, when we did up this room, we kind of sealed everything off a lot. Um, but believe it or not, ants don't like bay leaves. So you can put bay leaves around um, if ants have become a problem. But to be honest, I haven't, I haven't really had an ant problem in this room. I've been really lucky with that. So yeah. Yep. Any other questions? Now, Carmel spoke about um, the seed packs. So we've got them at the centre. So if after um, lockdown finishes, if you want to come in and collect your packet of seeds, um, then we've got them here. Um, for, for you to be able to pick up. So I actually sprinkled mine out yesterday in the garden. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so this is what yeah. you'll get. And there's there's actually 40 different varieties of um, seeds in here. I've basically taken three different packets of seeds and mixed them together. So there's 40 different varieties of flowers and herbs. Some of them are annual, some of them are perennial, so they'll come up again. Um, but they're all to help not just bees, but other insects as well. So to promote good insect balance, beneficial balance of insects and stuff in your garden. Yeah. Yeah. I think that might be. Might We're be. all done. No other questions? Yep. You've loaded up, loaded us, loaded us up with so much information today. So, yeah, um, I knew it was a big one. 
Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that knowledge. Hopefully that's helped everyone to understand a bit more about yep. um, beekeeping. Um, yep. Thank you for joining us. And as I said, um, it'll be up on our YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, but thank you so much, Carmel. Enjoy the, the nice weather. Everyone else, have a, a lovely day. And um, thank you for joining us. No worries. Thank you. So, yeah, just to recap, it's very rewarding. It can also be heartbreaking, but it's very rewarding. Um, and it, like a form of moving meditation, you will fall in love with your bees. Um, and as I said, if you wanted that document, just go to my website and all of that information is in that PDF. Yeah.